uh, go proceed to the next talk with the DVT and PE with Dr. Ash Guha. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So, you know, you must all be wondering you know, why are we talking about DVT PE? You know, now as more and more uh, interventional tools become available to treat thrombosis, you know, DVT PE is becoming much of a cardiology realm where a lot of the PERT programs or a PE response team programs are coming up across all hospitals, which are really being kind of run by uh, a, a multidisciplinary team involving cardiovascular surgery, cardiology, and uh, vascular surgery. So we'll go over a little bit um, of the basics of DVTP. It's a lot to cover in 10 minutes, but we'll go over with a little bit more emphasis on you know, uh, treatment and such. So as you're all aware, you know, um, venous thromboembolism is, uh, is really a burgeoning epidemic where you know, more and more patients are having you know, DVTs and PEs. And almost, if you look at the incidence of first time uh, thromboembolic event, it's almost one in 1,000 person years. And one in um, three patients present as PE and two in three um, patients present as DVT. And most PEs are always, uh, you know, in association with uh, a previous uh, DVT. And as you can see in the last line, within one month of diagnosis, the mortality rate is really high for, you know, patients with DVT and PE. So essentially, it's a harbinger of, uh, you know, badness, and usually it's due to the company it keeps. So as we can go through some of the risk factors for thromboembolism, you know, again, major um, Anything as, uh, which leads the patient to be bed bound in terms of whether they have had fractures or major orthopedic procedures or, or major uh, neurological trauma leading to um, you know, increased risk for uh, thromboembolism. And as you can see in the intermediate risk factors, malignancy is, is, a, um, is a big um, a contributor as it increases the thromboembolic risk um, due to hypercoagulable state. Uh, and same with a lot of end organ dysfunction, including you know, chronic heart and respiratory failure. So, I mean, this is something that, you know, uh, we all know in terms of how patients present, uh, you know, with uh, um, redness, swelling, and pain. So I'm going to skip over this slide. And uh, in terms of the criteria, you know, a lot of things, either, this has really not changed for almost, you know, 15 years where the Wells criteria has really been the, the clinical gold standard to risk stratify patients into low, intermediate, and high risk in terms of clinical pretest probability. So again, active cancer, paralysis, recently being bedridden, you know, calf swelling and uh, pitting edema. So all of these are, um, you know, going to a risk scoring system and we can come up with a low intermediate or high risk for DVT. And based on that, either you can go through a clinical biomarker, which is D-dimer, or uh, straight away go to venous duplex ultrasound to diagnose DVT. And uh, now switching gears to uh, pulmonary embolism. <clears throat> Again, you know, this is, um, as we are all aware, you know, patients come with dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain. Uh, and uh, there was a recent publication where a majority of patients who come in with syncope, almost 40% of them had an undiagnosed um, PE. So that's something that you, know, you all need to keep in consideration when you're seeing, when you get consulted for syncope as, you know, as cardiologists. So, um, the big thing to know is if you're suspecting PE and the patient is in shock or hypotension, then you really have very little time to act. So you have to really you know, determine if these patients are high risk or not high risk and then uh, go from there. So this is just a CT uh, angiogram for uh, acute PE. And as you can see here, this, uh, uh, the main uh, pulmonary artery is, you know, even before the bifurcation is, um, uh, is occluded, and um, again, so how do you uh, clinically uh, risk stratify patients? You know, this is much shorter than the, the DVT, you know, Wells criteria. Again, if you have a previous history of DVT, or if you have any signs of, you know, right heart failure, which is, which is man can manifest as heart rate greater than 100, and hemoptysis, or a history of cancer, or recent surgery, then uh, you can come up with a clinical pretest probability, and anything greater than six, you really have to worry about. 
So again, the same thing here. You either can go through a biomarker-driven uh, algorithm if your um, pretest probability is low, but if your pretest probability is high, then you have to go to a definitive uh, diagnosis, a diagnostic test, which is oftentimes these days in most uh, or, you know, um, hospitals a CTP um, protocol. So uh, again, if you don't have shock or hypotension, then you have time to go to a CT angiography and then uh, just stratify patients. But if you have uh, you know, shock or hypotension, you need to really, if you can get a CT in the ER, then that would be ideal. But if not, you need to you know, do a bedside ultrasound to see if the patient has RV strain or not, because you need to make a decision in terms of thrombolytic sooner than later. So um, there is a lot of uh, you know, you know um, controversy in the nomenclature of massive versus submassive P. I think everybody um, is in agreement with how to define massive um, PE, whether uh, anatomic or uh, you know, more physiologic, where it's associated. It's a ma you know uh, big PE which uh, is really in one of the proximal branches uh, of the pulmonary artery associated with you know, pr uh, profound hypotension and bradycardia. But when it comes to the submassive PE, that's where there is a lot of controversy in terms of how to define it. Um, now, um, uh, we will go over that in the uh, next couple of slides. Um, now, uh, again, the cornerstone of treatment of PEs have been uh, thrombolytics. Now, I think there is really no um, controversy in, in, in treating uh, patients with massive PE with thrombolytics uh, because, it, you know, one thing we know that uh, it's been shown to, you know, uh, decrease uh, the development of pulmonary hypertension, decrease um, death and hemodynamic compromise at seven days and decreased recurrence of PE. This is in patients with massive uh, PE. However, you know, there are disadvantages, thrombolytics, which leads to intracranial hemorrhage, especially in patients over, uh, over the age of 75. And there is other major bleeding risk. In, this was uh, uh, in the PLETO trial, which was a trial of using thrombolytics in, in PE. There was almost a 6% risk of other uh, bleeding episodes. Um, so, in terms of, again, evidence for thrombolytics, um, the number needed to treat is 59 for all-cause mortality benefit in patients with uh, massive PE. Uh, again, you know, now uh, I think um, uh, the area is sort of developing into whether we should use lesser and lesser uh, doses of thrombolytics. And uh, there was another trial uh, from the Phoenix group, the MOPET trial, which looked at half-dose thrombolytics. And actually, it was quite beneficial, but it reduced the bleeding risk significantly uh, in patients uh, with uh, massive PE. Um, I just wanted to touch briefly about you know uh, what uh, anticoagulation uh, to use as uh, you know uh, short term or long term in these patients. Um, I think the NOACs, so the newer anticoagulant agents, have been clearly shown to be uh, superior to warfarin. So the way to think about it is it's very clear when you have a patient with PE. If you think that it's an unprovoked PE, then these patients uh, sh uh, should be really on lifelong anticoagulation until unless there is a contraindication for um, uh, anticoagulation. If patients have provoked PE, then you can really um, make a determination based on you know, their uh, other risk factors and RV dysfunction to, um, to, to decide how long to treat. But usually, three to six months will suffice in patients with, um, uh, with uh, provoked PE. Now, I just wanted to touch upon briefly um, about um, uh, intermediate risk PE. I don't have slides on that. but. Um, uh, these are patients who do not have hypotension when you see them. So in these patients, if you have uh, evidence of RV dysfunction or if you have an evidence of um, uh, any biomarker leak, which means positive troponin or positive BNP, you can make a case for thrombolytics. Now, again, you have to um, uh, balance the risk of uh, you know, bleeding and the benefit. 
Now, there was a recent analysis uh, from the PETO trial, which was an intermediate risk PE trial, looking at thrombolytics. And uh, what they found was even though there was benefit within the first seven to 30 days, long-term benefit was not really there. There was no benefit at one year. And a lot of these patients who got thrombolytics were still very uh, symptomatic in terms of their dyspnea on exertion. So there is a lot of debate in the field in terms of whether, you know, in these patients who have uh, intermediate risk PEs, you know, whether you should be giving at least systemic uh, thrombolysis. So that's where some of these other um, uh, catheters come in. And, um, uh, uh, and I guess this is probably the older slides, I think, but uh, the newer slides had, uh, um, um, sorry, um, but there are certain catheters, and I just wanted to uh, uh, talk about one, uh, which is um, uh, the ecosystem. So it's um, uh, a catheter which sits in your pulmonary artery. You can put it through the IJ, and it delivers ultrasound pulses. And what you can do is, since the catheter sits in the PE, I mean, in the in the pulmonary artery, you can deliver lower doses of thrombolytics. And compared to, again, this is, was a really small trial of 140 patients, compared to, say, the MOPET trial, where you could do half-dose thrombolytics, the incidence of intracranial bleeds was really, really low. So that is where I think that, that frontier of treating PEs is exciting, and that's where the field is going to, where you're using lower dose thrombolytics with more catheter-directed um, thrombolytics to decrease the risk of ICH. But again, the long-term consequences of this are unknown and uh, you know, uh, remains to be seen. Uh, this is a quick thing about embolectomy. Again, in patients with massive PE with shock, either they need to go for surgical uh, embolectomy, and uh, uh, I see Dr. McGillivray there uh, at the back. I think we just uh, got a consult overnight for, uh, for, <laughs> for a submassive PE. So uh, I think, you know, at least for us, it's almost uh, weekly, if not um, uh, a couple of times a week. The, uh, we see a lot of these patients with submassive and uh, massive PE. Uh, and um, again, if you think the patient has a massive PE, you need to be calling your uh, cardiac surgeon so that they can take them to the OR sooner because that uh, really um, can be uh, life-saving in the, in the setting of ongoing hypotension. I think that's it. Thank you very much.